I am here to talk a little bit about electricity and show you some uh, not so gross video of dead frogs. Um, they try, they try. All right, let me get my hoo-ha going here and we will see what we can do. So, if you were out in the front this, uh, this afternoon and you got to make some electricity by spinning the little wire here, wave at me. You made electricity, yes. Well, this is a little electric generator and believe it or not, there are precious few ways in which you can make electricity. And, uh, and so we start off with making electricity the old fashioned way. Um, I'm going to be here after the movie, and so if you want to come up and we're going to have these set up and you want to play with this stuff and you want to chat with me, you're more than welcome to. So, here we have a schematic of an electric generator, the thing you were spinning, and what you see here is you have a magnet and the blue lines are a magnetic field. You've all played with those little magnets uh, when you were a kid, put them up on the television screen, and here you see um, a wire, and the way you make electric current the way you get charges to flow in a wire is by spinning that wire in the presence of a magnetic field. And this is what we call an electric generator. And aside from batteries or solar cells, that's the way you make electricity, believe it or not. Moving wires in the presence of magnetic fields. If you are generating electricity at the nuclear power plant in Crystal River, you're moving wires in magnetic fields. Um, there is a handout that was on the front table there that has some nice little websites that I think you'd like to carry away with you. Um, one of those websites lets you play with this electric generator and make electricity. Now the kind of electricity that we use in our homes is something called alternating current. And what that means is that as you spin this wire, the direction of the current flowing in the wire changes. You all know probably from high school science that uh, um, all things are made of atoms. And those atoms have protons and electrons. Well, in solids, the protons are all locked up in the nucleus. And it's the electrons that can move back and forth. And with alternating current, what happens is they jiggle back and forth 60 times a second. Sweet. Now, whether you are um, generating electricity at Crystal River or Apollo Beach, these are monster-sized electric generators. And the whole trick with electric generators is finding somebody to spin that wire in the presence of those permanent magnets. This is a schematic of a coal-fired power plant. This is what's down at Apollo Beach near where I live, and here is all the coal. And you dump that coal into an incinerator where you burn it, and you use the heat from burning that coal to boil water. You turn it to steam, and see this little thing right here? That's what you all were spinning in terms of an electric generator. And so the whole trick with making electricity is to find somebody to, uh, to spin the wires. And, uh, and uh, well, I can imagine you could hire some monkeys to do it for a couple of bananas. That, that wouldn't be too, too, too expensive. Now, um, just to give you an idea of how much you pay for your electricity, uh, this is a 10-watt light bulb that many of you were spinning wires trying to get to go. Imagine that you had 10 100-watt light bulbs, and you were going to light those 10 100-watt light bulbs for one hour. And so I'm going to hook you up and let you spin that bicycle and turn this crank to like 10 100 watt light bulbs for an hour. And then, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay you. Sweet. Yeah, easy money. Yeah, is this good? Are you thinking you're going to make some money? You've already spun this. You saw how hard it was to do, yes? Come on, easy money. Are you ready? I'm going to make you happy. I'm going to pay you about a dime. <laughs> That's about what you pay to light 10 100 watt light bulbs for an hour. You pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour and, and, uh, and that's what you pay. So electricity is nice and cheap, quite frankly. This is cheaper than bananas. Um, all right. So, oh yeah, I'm surprised too. Um, oh, I couldn't resist. I found the cute little picture of the monkey and, and I couldn't resist. That is sort of stunning. All right, so what does this say? This is one of those $10 words that we'd have to Google to get the definition. It says, it is Frankenstein, no? No, Frank, Frankenstein. Yeah? All right, so, all right, I'm an interactive guy. On three, you're all going to read this right there. One, two, three. Whoa. Sweet. Now, if we could dim the house lights just a wee bit, what I have here is something called a Jacob's Ladder. 
Th that's fine. Perfect. Thank you. This is something that you'll see in a lot of, of, uh, of monster movies. And uh, what it basically is, is it's a device that I plug in and um, it generates um, a voltage and does something really cool. Here we go. All right. Fingers crossed. Whoa. Now's the time. Ah, there you go. So what I've got is I've got um, about 15,000 volts, um, and I'm getting an electric current going from one of these wires to the other wire, and it's heating the air. And what happens to hot air? It starts with an R, ends with an Isis. Oh, y'all are good. Y'all are good. We'll give you all an A. And so you see these kinds of things in monster movies all the time. Uh, and it's all got to do with electricity. And so let's take a little closer look at what this brings us into. Uh, come on. There we go. So when we talk about electric current, I've already told you that in a solid, it's pretty much the electrons that do the moving in a solid. Because the protons are all locked up in the nucleus of an atom. And so when I talk about a current, a current is simply moving electrons. Um, what do we think of when we think of voltage? You can think of voltage as the push behind the current. And so the higher the voltage is, the greater the push. An analogy that works quite often is that of water in a pipe, where the voltage would be the pressure and the electric current would be the water. And so the higher the pressure, the faster the water moves through the pipe. Um, now this is um, a diagram of uh, a, a typical electric distribution system. And so here you see the power plant, the generator, where we're spinning those wires. Um, coming out of the generator, we go through all of the wires. And um, coming out of the generating facility, typically the push behind that electric current is from 100,000 volts to 300,000 volts. That's a lot of push. It's very dangerous to be around. It's in this stage of the electric power grid. Now there's something that is called a transformer, which is what this is right here. It's a device that takes high voltage, dangerous, 100,000, 300,000 volts worth of push, and turns it into lower voltage, a little bit safer, not so much push. I, I can get a little closer to it. And so it comes through some transformers here in these substations, and you've probably all seen those out by the Walmart. They put fences around them. It's something that looks like part of the electric power grid. Um, and typically that's stepped down to about 5,000 to 7,500 volts. Um, and you might have heard about a gentleman that was uh, um, fishing in Tarpon Springs that got his lure hooked in one of the power lines. 7,500 volts is enough push to electrocute you. And so this is why it's, it's dangerous to, more dangerous to put an antenna up on your attic than to plug in a toaster in your bathroom because uh, 5,000 volts is a lot of push and you can push a lot of current through it. Um, when you get into your neighborhood, if you um, still have power poles, they have another transformer down here on the power pole and that takes this 5,000 volts and takes it down to about 120 volts which is what comes into the outlet that's in your house. About 120 volts, you make a compromise. You get a lower voltage, you get a little bit safer uh, way to deal with things. And so this is how the electric grid is put together. Um, now, I say um, AC, uh, we think about, I said water in a pipe and water flows in a pipe from point A to point B. But the reality of it is that every wire in your house already has the electrons in it. And by plugging in your toaster, really all you're doing is you're jiggling those electrons back and forth is what you're doing. When you're talking about using a battery, DC, then you're pushing those electrons more from point A to point B. All right, now this is a, um, a web link that I've put on that little handout that I gave you. This is really cool. This is showing you the major transmission lines uh, in the United States power grid. And so these are the long distance transmission lines. Now, all of the electricity generated in the United States is tied together along three major grids. And all these grids are interconnected to each other where, where, they, uh, where they meet. And you can see that Texas pretty much is a grid in and of itself. And, uh, and you can see the transmission voltages are very large, 800,000 volts for lines that are going to go all the way across the country. Electricity in the United States is generated as needed on demand. 
This grid that you see here has zero storage capacity. And so if you want to run your air conditioner today, I've got to call up my power plant and have them spin those wires faster. If you don't want to run your air conditioner today, I'm going to call up my power plant because if they're spinning those wires faster and nobody's using it, it's just going to waste. And so it's an on-demand system. Um, I encourage you to hit this link because it is interactive and you can play with it. If you're curious about how much electricity in the state of Florida is generated from burning coal and how much is generated from burning natural gas and how much of it is hydroelectric, this link is going to tell you all of that and it'll show you where all your power plants are and so it's a wonderful web link to go and you can, can use it in a classroom and, and you can find out all sorts of neat stuff. So those are the major interconnections. And so why is it that a squirrel in Arizona can black out San Diego? Well, the, the system is generated on demand and, and everything is connected together. And this is another web link that I've got on the handout and, and it's posted to the Tampa Theater website. This is a simulation of the electric power grid. Um, and here you can see we have various transmission facilities. Here's a coal facility, hydroelectric, nuclear. We have a windmill in here. And you can see that this grid is connected to an external system. This is the interface, like from the Texas system to the Western system. Here we've got another interface, and here you can see the direction that the current is going. So here the current is flowing out of the local sub subsystem, and here the current is flowing out as well. This is a simulation, and you can diddle with it and, and uh, turn up the demand, and you can stress this system, which is what can happen when squirrels get into transformers in Arizona. And here you're seeing how I stress the system in the simulation and uh, you can make bad things happen and you can get nasty customers, uh, well, unhappy customers. And so here I've crashed that grid. Like I say, the reason um, that I'm showing you this is because it's really neat and it explains how one part of the grid is really interconnected into the other part of the grid. I encourage you to pick up the, the handout that I've got and go and play with this simulation. It's, uh, it's more fun than, uh, than, well, just than anything that I can imagine. Sweet. <laughs> and now you can read this. Now, um, as I was putting together things to bring to you today, um, I was concerned because uh, in, in the, I, I teach physics in the big lecture halls at USF, and, and they're not this big, but they're big. And so we have some nice big demonstrations that are lecture hall size demonstrations, but getting them down here was really a challenge, and so what I brought was tabletop demonstrations. And so you all just read this as... <laughs> Okay, now take it down about like a factor of 10. Shh, one more time. You all just read this as? And that's the size demonstration that I brought. <laughs> um, and so, let's turn down the house lights. Let's take a peek at this. This thing is called a Van de Graaff generator. It's named after Mr. Van de Graaff, 1800s. Um, and this puppy is nice and battery powered. So I'm, I'm gonna turn it on and uh, we might need to get the lights a little dimmer. A little dimmer. You see this in a lot of horror movies as well. And what it's doing is on one of these globes, we're building up a lot of electrons. Uh, and as I build up the electrons, the way that you create a voltage is by a separation of charge. And so I build up a lot of electrons and I get this big voltage and it's enough push to push electrons from one globe to another. Oh, see, that was a good one. Yeah. And we, and we can do the yay nice and softly. Yay! In high school, you might have put your hands on one of these and had your hair stand up. And that's by putting the, the charge is being transferred onto you and, and making all your hair stand up. And the hair on my arm is standing up right now. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn that puppy off. And we can bring those house lights back up. A Van de Graaff generator. Y'all are so nice. This is good. This is good. So let's take a little look at what we're taking a peek at here. So how this thing works is in this big blue piece here, I have a rubber belt, and I'm spinning that rubber belt, and it is rubbing. It's rubbing like that on a little wire brush that's on the bottom. And in rubbing on that little wire brush that's on the bottom, it's, uh, it's rubbing electrons off of that wire brush and depositing those electrons up on the, uh, the sphere that's up at the top here. And so I build up enough electrons on the top. They've got nowhere to go. More electrons, higher voltage. They jump across and they arc to that other ball. Now, has anybody ever been to the Museum of Science in Boston? 
They, there are larger ones of these, and, and they are a, a lot of fun. Now, here's what's interesting. You live in the lightning capital of this, well, uh, of the world. I think there's a place in Brazil that actually uh, uh, gets more strikes, but certainly we are the most populated uh, lightning capital of the world. Um, this is very much the way that a thunderstorm works. Uh, and what you have is you have uh, droplets of water and ice that are moving up and down, and it's friction. It's a rubbing of those droplets with, with the air and against each other that actually separates the charge in a thundercloud. Uh, and um, I said that in solids, electrons are what does the moving, but if I'm talking about a water drop, I can have some water drops that have had electrons rubbed off of them by other water drops, and if I lose electrons, then I've got sort of a plus charge because I'm short electrons, and if I pick up electrons, I've got sort of a, a minus charge because I've got extra electrons. And eventually I get enough separation of charge that there's enough push that I can get lightning strikes. And so this is basically how lightning works. Now, this is a picture of the uh, two monster Van de Graaff generators at the Museum of Science in Boston. And this is a cage, believe it or not, that has a person in it. And every time you go there, what they do is they, they'll put this person in this cage and they'll lift it up towards one of the Van de Graaff generators until they get this nice spark much bigger than what you just saw right here. Um, and let's see, I've got another picture of it. Ooh, now, oh, now see, that's right out of a science, a science movie, right? That is super cool. Now, the reason they do that is to illustrate to you uh, that the person in the cage is going to be safe. Uh, they're not going to be hurt by the electric current that's, that's flowing from the Van de Graaff generator down to the cage. And um, there is an explanation for this, and often the explanation that's given is the incorrect one. And I'm going to try and give you the correct one. But unless you're a physics major, then you won't know which one I've given you, and it can be anything you want, right? No. I, I, I don't make stuff up most of the time. Um, and so here's the deal. Um, they talk about a Faraday cage. Now here's what a Faraday cage is. Uh, Michael Faraday was a, a physicist who was self-educated in the 1800s. Uh, and, and he did a lot of studies about electricity and magnetism and made very significant contributions even though he didn't have any formal schooling. And the idea is this, if I have a conductor uh, and I put a lot of charge on it, you've all heard that opposites attract and likes Starts with an R, ends with an appel. Repel. Repel. Oh, see, y'all are good. I, I try this on my, my, my big lecture hall classes, and they usually uh, pick it up pretty quick. Li opposites attract and likes. Repel. All right, very good. So if I'm putting a lot of charge on a metal sphere like this, likes repel, and all that charge is going to be on the outside of the metal sphere. And so if I am on the inside of the metal sphere, then I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't have to worry too much about all that charge because likes repel. Now, that is not what's going on here. Because what's going on here, these charges aren't static. These charges are moving. There is an electric current. And so what you get is something called the skin effect. Um, it's the fact that the, uh, the charges are jiggling back and forth. And what happens there, well, you've all played with batteries. Batteries push all the current in one direction all the time. That's direct current. This horizontal line symbolizes one direction all the time, direct current. This jiggly line represents alternating current. It's going that way. No, it's going this way, that way, this way, that way, this way. And the current in a lightning strike is very much like an alternating current in that it is pulsed, it is momentary. And there's this thing of, in physics called electricity and magnetism, uh, where um, you don't get one without the other, and all currents create magnetic fields, and all magnetic fields are created by current. And uh, what happens is it pushes this current to the outside of a conductor. And so there's a current flowing. For the charge from here is flowing through this cage, but it's flowing along the outside of the cage because it's a, it's a pulse current, and it's this thing called the skin effect. Now that is, I probably just like drove half of you to sleep, right? <laughs> this is a beautiful theater, isn't it? Have you seen, have you seen the bathrooms? <laughs> if you have not seen the bathrooms, you missed your shot because this was the boring part. Uh, and, and so, I tell you this, if you haven't been into the ladies' bathroom, there's three little kittens on one of the doors, open that stall. Don't ask me how I know. Um, but I'm, no, and the guys, are, the guys that came without their spouses, they're going to think, man, how am I going to find that out? But not first. That's, I, that's, that's how you do it. So, so, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, 1818, she was young when she wrote this. 
And, uh, and what she had said was that one of the things that, that um, inspired her to write this movie was she was aware that, uh, that dead things would twitch um, when they were ex uh, hit with a little bit of electricity, when you put a little bit of voltage on them. And so I thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if I, uh, if I, if I brought something in here and, and killed it and, and, and put some voltage on it and let you all watch it twitch? No, I, di I did not think that. I did not think that, I promise you. I did the next best thing. I went to YouTube and got a gross video where somebody else had brought something in and killed it. No, no, I, I didn't, oh, they're, oh, they're all, I, I didn't do that either. Trust me, I didn't. Just so you know, um, USF is not responsible for the content of this presentation or for, <laughs> um, what I do have is a video from a lab class um, where, um, they, they did take a frog leg and, uh, and they've hooked some electrodes to it. And, um, and so here you can see the, the, the part of the frog leg up around the thigh and it goes down to the leg. Here you can see the electrodes where they're, they're putting the voltage on it and they're pushing electric charge to that frog leg. And what's going to happen is the muscles are going to respond to that and you'll see the leg twitch. Now, what's interesting about the way in which uh, the body muscles and nerves communicate is that they do use electric currents, but you're not restricted to negative charges in the body because that is a liquid. And in a liquid, just like when you have salt water, you can have positive charges and negative charges that are, that are moving and, uh, and can make things twitch. Oh, no! Did you see it twitch? I had, I had turned around. And, all right, sweet. Well, now, here is what I hope what I hope is that as a physics lecture, that was about the most painless 20 minutes physics lecture that you have ever had. Um, and I want to remind you, I'm done. The movie's coming. Uh, um, but I want to remind you that I'm going to be hanging around afterwards and I'll be more than happy. We're going to take this table, we're going to lower it to the floor here and you can come up and get a closer look at things. I'll be more than happy to talk with you. Um, and there was something else I was going to say, but it's just gone. Um, Frankenstein. Thank you very much. Enjoy the film.